Okay. Uh, you see the slide about denosing? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, so image denoising, I would say, uh, aside from image compression and uh, video compression, image denoising is, is really uh, the single topic that received quite a bit of attention for a very, very long time. Um, uh, either from the very early days of printing and scanning until these days. Um, it's a very, very broad topic. Uh, there's a lot of papers and research and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, product out there. Uh, it's uh, fascinating because in many cases, uh, you don't really have access to original image. Um, so what you have to deal with is uh, you have the signal with the noise and then you have to figure out um, how you can denoise this image and deal with the artifact at the same time. Um, so we'll split this into two uh, parts. Uh, today we'll talk at uh, kind of just the very basic spatial filters to build the intuition. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about the real filter and then we'll conclude with uh, what are the latest non-machine learning uh, 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 denoising algorithms that people uh, are still trying to to beat using machine learning. Uh, and uh, the, these advanced topics, I will not share with you so I can uh, test you on these. Uh, it's really more about sharing with you on Thursday what the intuition behind them. And you will see the intuition behind these three uh, uh, advanced image denoising is, is really very simple. And we're build, we building uh, toward this intuition between today and, and Thursday. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll understand the basics. Uh, we look at the spatial denoising filters and their types. Um, and there will be quite a bit of slides um, in, in today's lecture that I will be skipping through. You have them in the, in the PDF. There's not really much uh, to talk about, but I want to focus on certain concepts. That's why you see me spending quite a bit of time on a subset of slides, but not all, all, all slides on today. Um, so. Um, Let's get into it. Um, if you look at this image in here, then uh, for most of us, not all of us, uh, our our human vision system, our brains uh, uh, can can do the denoising for us, right? It, it's uh, right away. Uh, if the application, uh, what the task is that we are we are given is, uh, can you recognize this image, right? Uh, can you detect what that image is? Yes, it's a face of Einstein. Uh, with his tongue out, we have all seen that image before. Our brain is already uh, did the denoising for us uh, without us thinking about uh, edges and detection and all the other features. So, um, so we, we we our human vision system is amazing at denoising uh, things. Uh, uh, an example that I always uh, uh, show even to my kids uh, when you're already in the car and you're driving on a highway. And it's really draining quite a bit. Um, you still manage to see at least a few feet ahead of, of the vehicle. You are you are really kind of canceling out uh, the the noise that's coming from the air, uh, raindrops. Uh, and you're seeing through that uh, until it becomes very overwhelming. You cannot see anymore, but we we can see through that. Um, and it's it's really a, a feature of our human vision system that does uh, that does that uh, and without much effort from. From us, and we are really trying to make uh, I'm processing image denoising uh, as capable as as that, if if possible. Um, and you can see basically uh, uh, when when you denoise at the very beginning, before I I, I showed you this image in here, uh, you didn't your brain didn't really think about you know eyebrows and eyes and specific features. You just denoise overall because you already have seen the image before without any noise, and then you just your brain connected the dots per se, and then uh, denoise the image. Um, but uh, in, in many of our denoising algorithms, um, we look at this kind of local features and try to construct uh, our our F tilde or our denoise image using these. And then, but there is, there is quite a bit of uh, low level all the way to high level. There's context and there is the low level features and all of these kind of come together uh, in denoising. And, Again, it all depends on what the application is. The application recognition and detection is the application quality, is the application 
um, it, it depends what the application is. Uh, if it's recognition of what this phase is, then uh, we don't really need to worry much about the tiny details and the wrinkles and the hair and, and, and so on. Um, again, um, if you look at uh, uh, all kinds of different noise, it's, it's, uh, it depends on, um, I show this one here because um, it doesn't matter how, 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 how good your image sensor is, um, there is always some source of noise that's really happening either in the acquisition or in the, in the, in the processing or later on in the compression and streaming and transmission. Uh, so the one on the left hand side, um, I mean, this is kind of indoor, low lighting conditions. Uh, we have all experienced this and uh, with some shaking maybe while you're taking the photo. And there's quite a bit of noise. You can recognize that as humans. Uh, you can recognize even what the event is, what that, uh, what being the moment of being captured there. But nevertheless, there is quite a bit of noise happening uh, in, the, in the image. And the same thing in here for the snowy day, um, you can see uh, there's the lighting is an issue, not the lighting, the color is an issue. There is quite a bit of noise, like almost salt and paper noise happening around um, the entire image. And then you go to this class of images that are computational images. These are images, uh, basically you, 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 you capture a one dimensional signal and then you reconstruct the image uh, using some inverse problem uh, setup um, and uh, you create an image and the ultrasound is one of those. And uh, those are really very, very sensitive uh, images in general, uh, slight changes in your input one dimensional vector, and then you have quite a bit of impact on the two dimensional image being constructed. Uh, and the people have been doing the, all kinds of, you know, uh, clever things and this, uh, creating this image or imaging uh, for, for a long time. But the noise is almost like a, a constant, it's always there. Um, uh, you have kind of a deal with it. But when you come and now compress or you, you want to transmit or you want to uh, analyze the image, uh, then noise becomes really um, uh, a problem. Um, so uh, in general, uh, we can look at um, uh, sources of noise as uh, coming from acquisition piece uh, uh, or component or can be processing or compression, for example, is, is a good example of that. Um, or there is some transmission, right? Uh, when you're transmitting it, um, there must be some, there might be some some noise. Uh, although I want to be careful about transmission because nowadays we use packets network, so we don't really have noise as as we used to in the past, uh, where we have a wireless communication channel. We have almost like a an, a UDP uh, packet, and the packet will drop. So we transmission it includes packet losses uh, or network losses uh, as well. Um, and also when you are really reading from your hard drive, for example, I mean, that's, uh, to me, that's also a communication transmission medium from your hard drive. And you're, if you are missing some, some, some data or you are flipping some, some bits. Uh, so uh, we can define the problem as follows. You have a signal X or an image X and you have some noise in. And then um, if this noise additive, you add uh, one to one, meaning that at every single pixel, uh, you add uh, the corresponding noise component from the noise uh, vector, and then you have a noisy image Y. And then now you wanna denoise the image to get X hat, and there is an error between X hat and X, right? Um, and then you have to measure that, that error that you can measure using MSE, PSNR, SIM, uh, CSV, or any of the other uh, algorithms out there. And um, then this becomes your, um, this becomes your uh, your 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 uh, uh, optimization uh, function, right? Uh, how much you are uh, reducing, and again, the assumption here that you have x uh, as well as x hat, and here, and then you have the noise, and this is very important part. Uh, I'm showing you in here is that after you do the denoising, you have x hat. And you have x, and then you subtract x hat from uh, so, uh, from y, and then uh, what you have is n hat, meaning that uh, when you are denoising, um, this n hat in here is your um, computed noise component, right? Because what you have, you have y, you do the denoising, you get x hat. The difference between x hat and y is really the noise that you get rid of, right? And then if you look at this noise, and here, uh, so we have two criteria to measure how good 
your Dionysius algorithm uh, has done. You can compute the quality of X hat, either either PSNR or, or any other algorithm, how good the quality in X hat compared to X or just quality in X hat in general. The second one, which is equally important, is to really to look at how much of the image features or the image structure is still left in the noise uh, uh, estimation. So in hat is really your estimate of the noise, right? And you can see from this uh, toy uh, example in here, uh, if you look at our estimate of the noise in hat, you can see there are all these major uh, features, major like the edges, uh, the hat, um, uh, the shoulder, the background, some of the edges. So there are really some very strong uh, edge component that should belong to the image, not to the distortion, not to the noise, that are still present in our estimate of the noise. So uh, if that's the case, uh, then our estimation of the noise is not really as good as it should be, because uh, if this is a noise, then this is how it should look like as an estimate. So uh, both of these criteria are very important. People usually report quite a bit uh, about the quality of their uh, denoised image, but uh, I would say equally important is what is your estimate of the noise? Um, is there some structure of the original images left in your estimate of the noise? If that's the case, then uh, there is still room to improve in your denoising algorithm. Um, so there are uh, classical methods that we'll go through very quickly today. Uh, there is spatial uh, method, transform methods. And then uh, there are this kind of a family of methods um, in, the, in the past 10 years or so. And uh, some of them are, will be surprised how, how simple they are. Like NLM, for example, non-local means, is such a beautiful algorithm, it's very simple, but it's extremely effective um, and denoisy. And then we built on top of the NLM and uh, researcher came up with this PM3D, which is, a, again, it's a, it brings uh, everything together from the similarity using the image quality algorithm that we mentioned before. Uh, all together into denoising, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in more detail. So, so these kind of the state of the art methods uh, that we will talk about uh, on, on Thursday after we talk about the Wiener filter. So, look special methods, and then Thursday we start with the transform method, mainly the Wiener filter, and then we look at the state of the art, um, bring few things together into a beautiful uh, pipeline. So, uh, in the spatial domain, uh, there is a very um, uh, uh, fundamental assumption as a major one is that images are piecewise constant, uh, meaning that um, neighboring pixels uh, are, uh, are are highly correlated, which means that if you are denoising it, you are looking at the average of the neighboring pixels. And there was a question on Piazza about something related to this. Uh, so hopefully uh, this will be clarified in the next few minutes. So. If you have, uh, this is zoomed in to the linear image, and now uh, let's assume that we have a Gaussian smoothing filter, right? We would like to smooth, uh, meaning that go to uh, center your filter or kernel at a, at a pixel, and then you are using the neighboring, right? The neighboring uh, of that uh, pixel to find the denoised value for the pixel at the, at the center. And you keep shifting and then you you go to the next pixel and you denoise that pixel using the neighbor and so on. So imagine that we are using a Gaussian smoothing filter, a two-dimensional Gaussian smoothing filter, and uh, we are centering it around this pixel here, which uh, the whole area is really a feather, a lot of texture, lots of uh, uh, very, very busy uh, area. And then here you have um, a region where you have a very major uh, uh, high frequency or edge and then you have this area, which is uh, more uniform than the other two areas. In terms of density values, there is no really apparent edges in this region. And um, obviously, if you apply this Gaussian smoothing filter, then you can expect it to really work uh, uh, if you do it for the entire image. This is the resulting image on the right-hand side, right? And you can see, because we're using a, an, a, an averaging filter, it's a Gaussian, Basically, we are really blurring the image quite a bit, right? Um, it depends on the size of the kernel, uh, then uh, the blurry will be higher as the kernel size is, is higher. And you can see in here, um, if you compare these three areas, you can see the one on the right-hand side. And here, yes, I mean, the area originally it was a uniform, it was intensity values, more or less. So it did a good job here. However, 
for this region here, um, the, the, the sharpness in the major edge is gone, uh, right? It's, it's much more blurry than what even the noisy one is. So we didn't really do a good job. That's why we have this kind of red uh, X mark in here. In the very highly textured area, in the feather area, we didn't do a, job, a good job at all because we got rid of all uh, all these kind of textured uh, features. Uh, so this is not, not good performance in here as well. Um, yes, we removed the noise effect, but at the same time, the artifacts, uh, the, the side product is a very blurry, blurry image in here. And here's a toy example, uh, which I think is, is really beautiful because it just shows you what, what's happening. So uh, the way you look at this is uh, uh, if you, this is the image on the, on the bottom here, uh, and you can see go from black on the left all the way to the right on the right. And then in between there's this kind of uh, 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 an edge in the image. So the image is really, is, is we are, as if we are really having the image on the, on the ground, on the floor, uh, looking at it. And then the profile I was talking about a few minutes ago, uh, you take um, any row uh, in the image, right? And then this is first row, second row, third row, fourth row, and then you plot them as a one dimensional signal. Uh, then you have this kind of a, a curve like, uh, curve -like um, plot that gives you the profile of the image, right? Uh, so each, each one of these is, is one row. And you can see in here, uh, when we started with, we have a, an image that has noise in it. Um, but if you look at the edge, yes, the edge is very obvious, but as we apply averaging filter and the averaging filter is, is iteratively operating on the image, you can see what's really happening. Uh, we have now the jump that has, we had before jump from black to white, and then even with some noise happening, uh, that jump with the iteration is being reflected in that edge has been disappearing, right? And now you have much more blurry edge. So you can see the transition here at the bottom. You have more and more and more and more pixels that really belong to the transition between the black and white. And now you can see in here that the gray area is becoming bigger and bigger. So that feature that represents the edge, the sharpness in the image is gone, right? Because we are applying this uh, averaging filter. So um, this is kind of an illustration of, of how you should look at uh, denoising uh, uh, in, in general. And the question now becomes, okay, so we, we know that uh, if you look in the flat region, the black area in here or in the white area in here, uh, eventually we really did very good job in getting rid of the noise. The problem was in the center where we had the edge. And the question is, uh, can we apply this kind of filter, averaging filters or Gaussian filters uh, in general? And um, still operate in the uniform areas very well, very effectively as it is, and still maintain and preserve the details in the edges and so on. And that's really a question, a uh, very valid question to, um, that will lead us to the next one, which is, can we modify these methods to have a, more of a local adaptivity in them? Uh, so you smooth whenever you are, it's possible, and then preserve the fine details. So, so instead of having uh, dealing with all the three regions, uh, region one in red, and the yellow one, and the green one, as we did before equally, do we just blindly apply the same kernel everywhere? And here, um, if I have a, a pencil and it's like to say, what is really my, uh, my, my wish, uh, how the filter should look like, then yes, I'll use the same filter in this region, in the red region. In the yellow one, I would like the filter to really be along the edge direction. That's why I have this kind of uh, uh, egg shape uh, along the yellow area. And then for the green one, I would like really kind of the filter to have the shape, depends on the texture I have in there to maintain the, the edges in the very busy area. And um, so uh, the question becomes, um, uh, whenever you, you have to have some kind of a mechanism that give you um, the edge structure in the image. Uh, uh, and for example, if you compute the gradient of the image, um, and then this gradient in here will give you what basically the major uh, uh, edge components in the image. Um, and this region, the blue in here, you can see is uniform. There's not really much of edges. Uh, and it's a very smooth region. So you can just apply the Gaussian as it is. For this region here, we have a certain direction from the gradient. So you have to be very careful with that. And if you apply this knowledge, 
and adapts your Gaussian accordingly, uh, you get this image in here. Um, uh, of course, as I mentioned before, whatever you do, always there's an artifact, right? Uh, you can see in here, um, there is an edge uh, component, but we have some artifacts um, because our kernel shape is based on the grid, gradient of the image. Um, so, um, so what uh, people have done is to use this bilateral filtering. Uh, what we had before was, uh, don't worry about intensity, look at the space, and then um, just compute your Gaussian filter. Um, and then all what you need to do, just decide on what that kernel size. Is it three by three Gaussian filter? Is it five by five? Is it seven by seven, 15 by 15, and so on. And now, um, what we had before wasn't really the Gaussian filter in the green, right? This is the, just the green, and the sigma will just tell you, or the row in this case, will tell you how far you are, um, how how big your kernel. And remember, if you are using a 15 by 15 Gaussian filter, then your blurring uh, blurring effect is much higher than if you are using a five by five, right? Uh, so the row in here determines basically how big uh, your kernel is. But now the addition to this is really the second component, which is uh, it depends on the intensity value as well, right? Uh, so you have this bilateral, um, and then the product between the two, this becomes your bilateral filtering uh, in here because you're taking care of the, especially at the same time, how much variation you have in intensity values right? uh, in, in, in that region. Um, yeah, there's a comment, yes. Uh, so that's an ad hoc uh, uh, approach where you can get all the edges first, smooth the entire image and then basically add the edges afterward. Yes, uh, and the assumption here that the edges uh, are, are noise free, right? Which is uh, a big assumption in, in many cases, but that's also another uh, ad hoc approach uh, to do that. Um, so now, uh, if you have this uh, lift uh, uh, image, um, and this is from a paper from SIGGRAPH 2007, uh, that's the input you can see, uh, there's a rock uh, mountain, uh, there's some kind of a tree at the bottom you have in the background, you have sky with some clouds. Um, so you can see the four um, orange squares represent um, the same kind of uh, uh, circle that we have in the linear image where you have a smooth area in here. Uh, you have this box in here with a major edge uh, in, the, in this block. And here it is a very busy high texture region. Uh, so, um, if you apply Gaussian as it is to all of them, uh, so this is the block, this is the Gaussian, and you just do the Gaussian everywhere in the image, then you can get this image to the right hand side, which is a blurry image in this case. If you use the bilateral one, which is um, you, for example, for the smooth area, you apply the Gaussian as it is. Uh, for this region here, you scale. Remember the multiplication effect in here from the red part. Um, so in this case, um, you don't really uh, have half of the uh, kernel, and then uh, this one here depends on where the region is in this uh, in this uh, block. And this is the image on the right hand side. You can see between this one on the right hand side and this one on the right hand side, there is an improvement in in really kind of uh, not um, smoothing out, blurring the rock and the mountain uh, texture. Still, we within uh, each one of these, we haven't done really a good job in maintaining. The, the local edges and the local texture. Uh, but overall between this one and that one, just to give you an indication that this, this could be could be an improvement in here. And there are really tons of variation out there. Um, I mean, I wanna say tons, there are many thousands of, uh, of papers and algorithms um, that really relate the size of the kernel and depends on the entropy in the block, uh, and the images, and how you can really pick and choose between them. Um, as I mentioned, denoising is really a very, very big subject. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, I would say, the most busy subject in crossing for many decades. So, uh, so what? Uh, so, so far, I just kind of uh, give you an intuition of, of what could be the parameter, what you have to worry about when you are doing dealing with denoising, uh, denoising of, of natural images. So, um, in the transform domain, um, imagine that you have this kind of a uh, uh, space representation of the intensity values of the pixel values and the noise. So you have the green and the red um, representing the intensity values and the noise respectively. And then what you would love to do is to transform this into some kind of a space where it becomes easier for you to separate the red from the green or the noise from the, 
from the data, right? And then you can just get rid of, uh, have, have a, a threshold and get rid of the noisy data, and then you maintain the, uh, the, the image data that you, you would like to keep. Um, so, um, so in, in, in bringing that back to, um, to how we, we look at the spectrum of a signal, um, and then if you, this is the signal in the green, and then the noise, uh, if it's a Gaussian, a white Gaussian, a white, uh, white noise, then uh, it's uniform throughout uh, the spectrum, and that's being represented by the red uh, bar in here. And if you apply a low-pass filter to that, then basically um, you are really getting rid of um, uh, the data at the high frequency, but also the noise, because at the high frequency content, the noise, either here or there, the noise is really overwhelming the signal, right? Uh, so when you are, um, Having a, applying a low pass filter, which is really what the Gaussian kernel is doing. What you're really doing is you're really getting rid of uh, the impact of the noise uh, when it's really overwhelming uh, the signal, when the signal to noise ratio is very low at the high frequency content. But at the same time, what you are really introducing is a blurry effect because you are getting rid of the high frequency content of the, of the image. And that's really what the whole Gaussian kernel is trying uh, to do. And then um, the question is, what would be uh, what would be an optimal filter in this case? Uh, what what would be the uh, the optimal filter, not just to have blindly an averaging filter uh, like that? And that's the the question uh, that we always have in in denoising. Uh, and uh, we look at some ad hoc approaches today, and then on Wednesday, um, on sorry, on Thursday, we will look at uh, more. Um, mathematically uh, attractable ways to really get this optimal filter uh, kernel in here. So uh, noise models, if you look at the Gonzalez book or the other books, uh, they have tons of noise models out there. So if you look at the, historically, what people have been looking at is uh, the best way to do a denoising is first to figure out what kind of noise you have. And then once you know what the noise you have, then you can denoise. And that's basically what you have in the and some of the questions in the homework, uh, uh, the last homework you have, uh, problem set number eight. So at a very high level, you have additive noise, which is kind of the easiest to deal with um, uh, and for mathematical reasons, becomes easier to deal with. And then you have the multiplicative one where you have a modulation, you have the region F, you add to it a modulated um, F multiplied by the noise V, right? And uh, these two additive and multiplicative one, we don't usually don't have really structure, um, so we call them really kind of more of a random uh, structure. Uh, but the third noise type is really periodic noise. There is a noise that's really periodic, either because of the sensing mechanism, the acquisition setup, or because of some kind of the 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 inverse problem, the imaging algorithm that we are using uh, is bringing this kind of periodic noise into the picture. <clears throat> Okay, so if you have periodic noise, uh, so this is a kind of a sine noise pattern on the left-hand side. And then if you look at the spectrum, then you can see it's a, it's a very well uh, structured kind of noise in the frequency domain. So there's this periodicity piece of it that can be represented on the right-hand side. Then you know exactly basically when you have a spectrum, which a component to zero out, uh, if, if you know uh, and what, what kind of pattern, what kind of noise you have. And this is another one, uh, another sign noise pattern. Um, and then if you look at the frequency domain, then you know exactly where to go to zero out uh, the effect of that noise. But usually it's not that simple, right? Uh, so uh, to start with, uh, let's see, uh, assume that uh, for the sake of discussion for now, although it's a very, very big assumption that every single pixel is a random variable and then, um, these random variables that basically they are not correlated. That means uh, the impact of the noise on a single pixel is not related, is unrelated and uncorrelated to the effect of the noise on the neighboring pixel, right? Um, so we'll say basically uh, the noise is uncorrelated with the image as well, which is valid, uh, unless you have an inverse problem um, in competition imaging, which this second assumption may not be very valid. But in general, the noise is not correlated with the image uh, in general. So 
what kind of noise we are dealing with. Uh, and uh, I will not go through the details of what these noise models are. I'll just show you some examples, but I think I have only two of them in here uh, because they are very popular. The Gaussian noise one uh, is kind of one of them. Easy to deal with mathematically. Uh, you have only two parameters to deal with. Uh, you have the mean and the, especially the mu and the sigma, the mean and the standard deviation uh, or the variance to deal with, um, to, set, to, to really specify what that noise is. Uh, electronic circuit noise uh, is, is usually modeled using Gaussian noise. And uh, for all kinds of these sensing uh, mechanisms, uh, the sensing noise is, is a Gaussian noise in general, not always, but in general uh, is the case. Um, here is an example of the Barbara image on the left hand side. And if you add to it um, a Gaussian noise with zero mean and a variance of only 0 0.01. Um, and this is something I want to uh, add to those who uh, are either doing project on the denoising or uh, with the electricity and looking at some papers out there. Um, just look at this example in here and you see the effect of one over 100 variance of a Gaussian noise in the image. This is a uh, I was, this is not mild. I mean, this is really uh, almost severe noise, right? Um, so you can see some papers, uh, they will give you a plot and then you have on the X axis, you have sigmas. Um, and then that sigma can go from like, you know, like uh, 0 0.01 and then 0 0.1 and then one and then five and then 10. And, and, and the performance is amazing when you have sigma of five and 10 or even 40 and 50 I have seen. Um, and uh, that's really very severe noise, very, very severe noise. And uh, in most cases, the noise you have is really at the low sigma values, like it's 0 0.01, maybe 0 0.1 uh, and so on. So um, it's just keep in mind, you wanna have your assumption and your experiment to be uh, more realistic than just to show how good the algorithm is performing when you have very, very severe uh, uh, noise, uh, when the signal to noise ratio becomes almost zero. Um, another uh, uh, one that we can really generalize the Gaussian uh, to be of this uh, form and this uh, based on the value of alpha, then we can have a Laplacian distribution, a Gaussian distribution, or a uniform uh, distribution, and we have the gamma function here. Uh, so uh, I will not really get into much of detail uh, about the different models. I will, I will show you some PDFs later on, but um, that's not really the important part for us in this in this lecture, at, at least. Uh, the final one um, is called salt and pepper, and this is really more about, you know, circuit reading, maybe uh, scanning, transmission over the old uh, wireless communication uh, networks. Um, but the idea in here, you switch your your uh, you have a saturation that's really happening randomly throughout the image, so your pixel becomes really more than 255 or become very negative. Um, and that's why you have salt and paper, so black and uh, white and black uh, kind of, or on and off uh, kind of uh, effect in here. Um, <coughs> so you can really model that uh, using uh, P and one minus P in here. Uh, uh, but here is what uh, uh, um, the important things to us. Uh, you can have all kinds of different uh, models for the noise. And uh, the most general one that you can see in, in textbooks is really kind of gamma noise, exponential noise, uniform noise, uh, Gaussian noise, of course, Laplacian, Rayleigh, periodic noise. Um, so what's really important to us is uh, if you look classical methods, we have the spatial filters or the averaging filters, and we have the rank filters, and then we have the Wheeler filter. And then which one of these uh, is, is good when? for what kind of uh, noise model. Um, and to do that, this is some question that was, I think was on, 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 uh, on Piazza, on how, how do you look, identify a uniform area, right? And if you look at this image from Gonzalez's book, um, uh, there are really three intensity values. And it's a very good toy example, uh, actually, for this kind of topic. Uh, what you have in the disk in the center, you have one intensity value surrounded by uh, another uh, set of pixels uh, that have the same intensity value. And then you have the outer uh, um, square uh, that has darker intensity values. So you have three intensity values representing this image. So if you plot the histogram, then you should really have only three intensity values between zero and 55 that are being represented. Um, 
So now the question is, if you are giving us such an image, what you want to do is uh, to estimate what kind of noise that happened to it, right? Uh, and here is the PDF of the noise model that we talked about, like Gaussian, Rayleigh, gamma, exponential, a uniform, and an impulse. Like for the salt and paper, for example, you will have an impulse, right, like this. So this is really, this one here is the salt and paper one. Um, so now, uh, without having any side information about what kind of noise, if I receive an image like this one, and then I go to certain area that's uniform, like that area can be in the one in the middle, or it can be one in the in the between in here, or the one in the outer square. Um, so this looks uniform. I take any patch, uh, and then I plot the histogram of that patch. Then because the baseline, the, all the intensity values are the same, then any variation in the histogram, it's a reflection of the noise uh, PDF, right? Um, uh, and that's basically kind of the idea behind that, that small exercise in the, in the problem set. Um, so if you take this image, uh, again, uh, this image has only two intensity values, right? Uh, um, there is one at 50, uh, this is the histogram, and there is another one at 200, uh, and it seems there is another one at 255, right? Uh, is, uh, in here. So there are three intensity values actually in this, in this image. And if you add to it some noise, um, then you plot the histogram, then you can see uh, you still have, um, you don't really have uh, the sharp uh, histogram as you had before, the impulse ones, but you have this kind of a shape uh, around it. And you can see from this shape in here, you compare this shape with the shapes of uh, with the PD of the noise model and say, okay, this most likely looked like a, a Gaussian noise. So now, you say, okay, this noise in here is looks like a Gaussian noise um, that added to the image. So now I know which one uh, uh, I need to add to it, right? Uh, or it could be a salt and paper one as well, right? Um, so these are the things you 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 are looking at when you are uh, uh, doing this practice. So for this example in here, if I take the patch around this region here, and then I do the histogram only for this part in here, and the histogram look like something like this, all right? Uh, I think right away you can say, uh, okay, this very much look like a Gaussian noise being applied to the image. And that's the whole point of, of doing that uh, in your images. Back to our Gonzalez image. Um, if you add, if you have three different images that have three different noise add to, to them, if you plot the histogram, um, we know that the original image noise free should have three impulses, right? There are only three intensity values are being represented by this image. But uh, for these three noisy images, you can see we have these three histograms and the shape of every histogram in here um, give you really a good indication of what kind of noise has been added to the image. So the first one is Gaussian, the second one is Raleigh, and then the third one is gamma kind of noise. Um, and continuation, uh, so the exponential, uniform, and salt and paper, uh, as you can see in here. Um, so you can see that's the, the whole kind of answer the question on Piazza, what, why are we doing this? And what was the point of doing this? The whole idea is just to give you a practice of, um, even if you don't have some information about what kind of process the image went through, uh, then you can de deduct some kind of information from the image by looking at the uniform areas in the image itself. Um, um, just basically kind of a more uh, in-depth uh, look at uh, the patches that we uh, we took from uh, from here, we took from the middle one, uh, and then how the shades uh, or the PDFs uh, look like on the histograms. Okay, the rest is the same thing. Um, these are different kind of circuit boards uh, uh, effects. I will not really get into those. Uh, okay, um, questions. Okay, so there are two filters I want to talk about today. The first ones are uh, mean filters, and the other one is our rank filters. Um, so the spatial filters or spatial mean filters, you can imagine basically what you have is you go to every single pixel at the center of your kernel, and then you replace the value with some kind of an average of the surrounding pixels in the in the in the neighborhood, right? In the in the block center of that particular pixel. Um, so always the column here is you have will have a blurry image as a result, right? Uh, so this is the generalization of the mean filter in here, um, and uh, 
there are uh, different uh, ways uh, that determine what kind of filter you are dealing with. It depends on the value for the p in here. So if p is equal to one, you know, have arithmetic mean, right? Uh, and then um, the other mechanism actually, or the other um, parameter is how big your neighborhood should be, right? Um, because if you do it very, very small, you don't have enough uh, variation to make it very big, then you have your very effect is much bigger. Um, uh, again, don't worry about the Z transform stuff in these slides. Uh, this is from uh, when I used to teach this more toward the undergraduate of 4270 uh, terminology. Um, so what I wanna lead to, uh, Okay, here is some impact of, you know, uh, what the results would look like. Uh, but I really wanna go to, yeah, this is another for the circuit board. I, what I want to focus on when you look at the results um, between this one and this one, you look um, as an expert in images, uh, you look at, uh, as you guys, you look at the scarf and you have these kind of edges, right? You have these kind of plus in parallel. Um, you look at the smooth areas in the background, which expect them to be smooth. And these are the regions that you can look at and say, okay, is, is, the, is the algorithm doing good job or not? Uh, look at the pants, for example, they have kind of these stripes in them. And you can see the algorithm is really missing um, or introducing quite a bit of errors, right? Uh, you can see these kind of uh, dots or, or blanks in here, same thing in here. So these are artifacts from the algorithm itself in here. Um, and then when you look at something like this, then what, what you look at, um, especially in this such a board, uh, circuit board, is to, there will be some thin lines, like, you know, some thin lines with the original, uh, uh, the original uh, image. And this one's in here, for example. And after you do denoising, uh, there is a very good chance uh, you, you make these thin lines disappear, uh, or you make them thicker, or you make them uh, narrower, uh, and, and so on. So these are the things you, you have to look at uh, when you are looking at, uh, um, at denoising. For example, if you compare this part of the this image and this part in here, it's very obvious. These 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 lines in here, right? They are thinner than the ones on the right hand side, in here, right? So this one C in here was obtained using arithmetic uh, mean filter. Uh, the one on the right hand side using the geometric mean filter. So you can see this is the impact of things that you look at. If you look at this part of the board. You can see they are already thicker. This one is the thinner, is thinner. Um, the same thing everywhere, like this one here, this one there, uh, and so on. So these are the things you have to keep an eye on when you are uh, visually uh, inspecting an output from a denoising or a restoration uh, algorithm. And then the second one is, uh, so we had the generalized uh, averaging filter, arithmetic or geometric uh, mean filters, and now we have the harmonic mean filter. Uh, and uh, this one is really special because it depends on what kind of salt and paper kind of noise you have. Um, and uh, this is an example in here that shows you, um, so this is the total number of pixels in the neighborhood in, so in this case is nine, because we're looking at three by three pixel uh, neighborhood. And then you sum uh, all the one over the values of all the pixels in the neighborhood. So in here, uh, all that sum is all zero except one. And this, we have this kind of increment in here, just not to uh, divide by a zero. So we have one in here. So we end up with really the value. If you look at this pixel here, this neighborhood, you say, yeah, the one is an outlier, should be a zero. Uh, but after applying this filter in here, so you cannot really remove the salt uh, filter. So, sorry, this should be a one. This one should be a one here. This should be a one. Right, um, so um, you can see from here that uh, it, it is not really doing a good job with the salt noise. Uh, the paper noise, because it should be one everywhere, but there's a paper noise where you have a zero in the center. And then if you plug it into here, you have nine over one everywhere is one except the center. So overall, um, you are really doing a one. So this should be a one in here, right? Uh, this should be a one. So this is fixed to be a one in here. So you can see that uh, it can remove the paper noise but cannot remove the salt noise. So you have this kind of uh, different spatial filters. They work for certain things, but not for other things. Um, and that's the whole point of, of sharing this slide in here with you. And then you go to the contra-harmonic mean filter, and then you have this kind of a sign that give you the filter order called uh, D. 
and this D in here, uh, the sign of this D will tell you it works for what kind of uh, noise. Uh, so a negative D uh, will be good to remove this outlier. And then a positive D will be good to remove this kind of outlier. Right? Uh, you can think of this outlier as, as, a, as a paper. You can look at this outlier as a salt. So the negative one is good for the salt noise. Uh, the positive uh, filter order is very good for the paper noise. Uh, so, uh, but if you uh, choose the wrong sign, uh, and here's, here's uh, an example before I show you the wrong sign. So you have um, paper noise, probability of uh, 10%. And if you apply a contraharmonic filter with the filter D equal 1.5, it's called Q, but it should be D uh, is the same. Um, the, order, the filter order is 1.5 is the positive one. Here is the, the filtered image. And you can see it did really a very good job uh, in there. And then if you have a salt noise only, no paper, and then the probability is 10%, and then you apply a harmonic filter, but now you have a negative 1.5, right? Then this is the impact. Uh, so you can see it did some denoising uh, as, as expected. If you inverse this operation, uh, the sign, uh, then it's exactly the same as the previous slide, but you, you, you change the sign of the D. Uh, you use negative 1.5 on the left, you get this horrible outcome, and then you get positive 1.5 on the right, and you get this horrible outcome. Um, so you can see that the sign in this case is very, uh, very important. Uh, um, and more and more examples, uh, that's what I have, basically quite a bit throughout the PDF, but you can just look at them uh, uh, yourself. And then uh, we look at the rank filter. So now, so the main message, uh, if, if there's one message out of all of this today, is that when you are denoising um, an image, and the question is, you you are about to replace the pixel value with a, another value. And the question is, do you want to bring a new value? Um, that's what the averaging filter is. Like in general, you are using the neighboring filter images, uh, pixels, and you are calculating an average in, in some average, right? some combination. And then you are having a new value there. That value didn't, most likely doesn't exist in the neighborhood. It's a new value, a new numerical value. And then, or you want to use kind of this kind of filters, like rank filters. You don't really want to bring something new. You want to use one of the existing numerical intensity values, and you didn't want to be innovative and bring another value. And that's what really the rank filter uh, is all about. So, uh, so what the rank filter, as the name says, uh, you can uh, choose what kind of rank uh, you want to use as a criteria. It can be a median filter. Uh, it can be a maximum filter, a minimum filter a midpoint, uh, and so on. Usually these are not very good. So we saw before, uh, averaging filters are good when you have impulse noises. Uh, that's this like a salt and paper, for example. Um, but they are not really very good when you have Gaussian noise because of the blurring effect. Because you are bringing in this new values that are the average of the neighborhood. And then you start to have this transition between low intensity values and high intensity values, give you this blurring effect. But in this case, the rank filters, usually they are really the most effective um, when you have this kind of Gaussian noise, uh, uh, as we'll see in here. So when you ask, uh, when you talk about rank filter, one of the, when before what we had in the averaging filter, uh, we, we, we have to decide on the direction, right? Uh, we have to decide on the kernel size. In here, in the median filter, uh, the idea is what would be the, the lattice that we'll be using. So if you have this image on the left-hand side, um, and then um, the one in the center, we are really um, denoising the pixel at the, at the center. If you are using a three by three kernel, as we have in here, uh, then you are using the median, right? Um, or, or in, in this region. And that median will give you a one, right? But uh, if you use a lattice with this shape, it's like an X kind of shape, and they're using these values, five values, to decide on the medium. It will give you a totally different value, right? So now that's become basically kind of the the shape. The lattice uh, is is a, is another design criteria in here. <coughs> that could be obtained using the edge map or the gradient map, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, here's some examples um, where uh, what we have in here is the median filter. 
what we have in here um, is the median, uh, hold on, what's this? Uh, yeah, this is the second iteration, actually. This is the second iteration for the median filter, and this is the third iteration of the median filter, yes. Um, so you can see we, we, we had some misses here, you can see we missed some points. Second iteration, um, we improved some, but not all of them. The third iteration, we improved uh, quite a bit. Are the artifacts? Uh, you can see the artifacts are not in the blurry, but in really completely missing up the stripes shape, right? You can see in here, the stripe shapes is, is, is messed up uh, and, and the head's uh, scarf and the, the pants. Um, but the blurring effect is not there. Uh, this is uh, a pepper noise. Again, same thing. Uh, uh, let me see. Yes, pepper noise on the left. This is salt noise on the right. Okay, that makes sense. And now we have uh, the pepper noise image with a three by three maximum filter. Because we are using a max, then we are really expect to have what? We have a much lighter washed out uh, white kind of an image. And you can see in here, that explains why we have all these white regions, uh, the scarf and the table cloth and the pants as well. And then uh, this image in here, we use the solenoids image, but now we apply a minimum filter, three by three minimum filter. And we really get rid of the uh, noise, but we introduced an artifact, which is a darker image. So what we do after this, we take these two images and we apply some kind of a histogram equalization or matching to, to, to improve the dynamic range um, uh, in these two images. More examples in here um, from Gonzalez's book. And um, here's an illustration of what's really happening and why uh, uh, the media filter are good to remove spike noise, why the media filter uh, it preserve, uh, uh, sorry, the media filter preserve some edges. So if you look at, uh, this is the, uh, assume uh, the image um, before denoising, and then you have this kind of spikes, uh, which we, re, we refer to them as re noise in this case. And if you have a kind of, some kind of a neighborhood of five, five pixels, you apply the median filter, then you really get rid of that. Um, and then um, if you have this kind of edge component, in your image, you apply a medium filter, to some extent you are still preserving uh, that edge component because you are not really bringing any new value uh, based on an average of other values around that image. Uh, and that this whole feature of really removing spike noise and preserving edges uh, brought this up, uh, brought this uh, new filter called trimmed mean filter. Um, and uh, it's a combination between uh, the rank filters and the, and the media filters. So the whole idea behind these two blocks, uh, the first block is um, you have the noisy image, you have some kind of a neighborhood um, or block in the image. The first thing you do, you rank the pixels um, and then you remove the largest, uh, uh, sorry, the largest and smallest, so the smallest here. Uh, Not easy to write. Okay, and the smallest d values. So you have to decide to say basically um, the largest, maybe uh, largest one and the largest and smallest value, or the largest two and the smallest two, va two values, and so on um, that you want to remove. And then you use the remaining uh, pixels in that neighborhood of that block to do an averaging filter. Um, and this way we call a trim mean filter. Uh, so you're not really biased toward these large uh, and smallest components in that filter. And um, it's of course, there's an ad hoc one because the decision on D uh, becomes really more and less as an ad hoc approach, try and error. Um, so uh, if you look at this image, we have an additive uniform noise additive. This image, we have a salt and paper noise additive. We take, um, this image and we filter it with an arithmetic mean filter and this is the geometric mean filter and then we take the this one here have to apply a median filter and this one we have the alpha trimmed mean filter with d equal to four meaning that we take the uh, five by five that's 25 pixels 
we take the highest four, the lowest four, we get rid of these eight pixels in our calculation of the mean filter. And here's what we obtain. In here. Um, so uh, is, is this always better than uh, what we have in here? Uh, it's always a question, right? Uh, what kind of pattern? You can see we missed quite a bit in here. We have still blurring effect uh, happening. Uh, do we have still stripes? I don't see stripes getting maintained here or there. Uh, but the stripes in here actually are maintained. Um, so it's always this kind of trade-off in between between the methods. Uh, it is more of a, a, a zoomed in, uh, and you can see the effect of this of the blaring in here. Uh, and here is much better than that in terms of blaring. But did we do a better job in denoising? You can look at this part, this part in here. And here, I think we always do. I think we did a very good job, but not in the pants and the, and the table. Floor. More examples from the circuit board from Gonzalez's book. Uh, I'll not really go through these. Uh, and then I want to conclude with this uh, heuristic uh, adaptive approach. Uh, and it, it has these steps. Uh, you check first if the pixel is correct or not. Uh, and then if it's noisy, based on some kind of uh, criteria, then you decide of what kind of algorithm you want to apply to it. And uh, the whole idea is really to compute um, how far you are from the mean and the variance in that in that, in that block. Um, um, I will stop here because I really want to get to a filter uh, next time. So uh, the, the main messages I, I, I want to get out of today the sharpening we did Laplacian before we hopefully today you knew how to to look at what that means um, and why we use Laplacian to really sharpen an edge. But in the denoising, uh, there is that kind of uh, idea of um, it has to be local, it cannot be global, right? Uh, and then when you have local, that means what? That means uh, the features that are dominating that block, the local, is the main criteria. So that that whatever that means, if the feature space uh, is decided by some criteria, whatever the criteria is, can be edge entropy, can be any kind of a criteria. It's uh, if if it gives me that this is a smooth region, or there is a major edge, or a very highly textured, or in between, then that gives me basically an indication of what kind of filter I want to apply. And then the next the question is deciding what kind of filter I want to apply. I need to ask myself, do I want to use an averaging kind of median filters, mean filters, or should I use um, rank filters or something in between, like a trimmed mean filter? Uh, because the first one, we know that will be, have a blurry effect uh, because I'm introducing these new values in between the existing values, or the uh, the rank filter, which will I'm using one of the existing filters, so the sharpness in the image will remain as it is, more or less. Uh, it might be the wrong sharpening, but still a sharp image, not, not a blurry image. Um, and now, um, this whole idea, if you think about it, um, what we need to decide on is what area we need to use, right? And we'll look at the BM3D and non-local mean. Uh, yes, we're looking at the neighboring pixels, but we also look at neighboring pixels that match that block everywhere in the image or the image data set. Right. So, what what kind of neighboring pixels? What that what that means is we have to decide on what kind of criteria we need to use to decide on what features are there in that in that block to decide on the kernel, and then um, do I want to have a new value for the denoise pixel or one of the existing values I should reuse? Right. So these are the kind of throughout the whole denoising algorithms. These are kind of the major questions. Um, that that will always be the same. Um, and next time we'll look at some more optimal solution using weird filters, and then um, we'll look at the most advanced ones, including the one that we have in the project. Questions before we conclude? Okay, thank you everyone. I will see you Thursday. Thanks. Bye-bye.